The first reading for the 24th Sunday in Ordinary Time is a reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, go down at once to your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, for they have become depraved. They have soon turned aside from the way I pointed out to them, making for themselves a molten calf and worshiping it, sacrificing to it and crying out, this is your Lord, this is your God, O Lord, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I see how stiff-necked these people are, continued the Lord to Moses. Let me alone then, that my wrath may blaze up against them to consume them. Then I will make of you a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, saying, Why, O Lord, should your wrath blaze up against your own people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, with such great power and with so strong a hand? Remember your servants, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, your chosen ones, and how you swore to them by your own self, saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And all this land that I promised, I will give your descendants as their perpetual heritage. So God relented in the punishment God had threatened to inflict on the people. The word of God. The psalm response today is, I will rise and return home. Have mercy on me, O God, in your goodness. In the greatness of your compassion, wipe out my offense. Thoroughly wash me from my guilt, and of my sin cleanse me. I will rise and return home. A clean heart create for me, O God, and a steadfast spirit renew within me. Cast me not out from your presence, and your Holy Spirit take not from me. I will rise and return home. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. My sacrifice, O God, is a contrite spirit, a heart contrite and humbled, O God, you will not spurn. I will rise and return home. The second reading is a reading from the first letter of Paul to Timothy. Beloved, I think the one who has strengthened me, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he considered me trustworthy in appointing me to the ministry. I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and arrogant, but I have been mercifully treated because I acted out of ignorance in my unbelief. Indeed, the grace of our Lord has been abundant along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of these, I am the foremost, but for that reason, I was mercifully treated so that in me as the foremost, Christ Jesus might display all his patience as an example for those who would come to believe in him for everlasting life. To the ruler of ages, incorruptible, invisible, the only God, honor and glory forever and ever, amen. The word of God. The Lord be with you. Thank you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus. But the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them he addressed this parable. Who among you have a hundred sheep and losing one of them 
would not leave the 99 in the desert and go after the lost one until it is found. And when he does find it, he sets it on his shoulders with great joy, and upon his arrival home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in just the same way, there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. Or what woman, having 10 coins and losing one, would not light a lamp and sweep the house, searching carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says to them, rejoice with me because I have found the coin that I lost. In just the same way, I tell you, they'll be rejoicing among the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. This week we lost two giants in our world. The first is kind of known around the world, Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of England. The other is less known to the world, but someone who was influential in my world, and that is Dr. James Evans. He was one of three of my favorite preachers, Father Jim, Dr. McMickle, and Dr. James Evans. He was the ninth president of Colgate Rochester Divinity School, but he was the first African-American president in the school's history. And I encountered him in 2019 as president of the Black Student Caucus, I had the opportunity to introduce him at our spring lecture series to a room full of students and staff and pastors and leaders and community members, people who came from many places across the community to hear his talk. He was not only brilliant in his theological perspectives, but his use of humor and humility and compassion and challenge for transformative change just kept you on the edge of your seat. Dr. Evans was known for his inclusion, his inclusive commitment in advocating for individuals and groups who were historically underrepresented. His role as president of CRCDS and a member of the Baptist Ordination Review Committee he was one of the first in our city to really model courage in appointing women and promoting them, members of the LGBTQI community, and people of color in ministerial roles. And these decisions that he made often resulted in criticism outside of and within the institution. But his commitment to the full family of God is why people love to come and hear him preach and teach. And he is someone who whose life has touched everyone that he's ever met, and he's left an indelible footprint on our city. But I realized that Dr. Evans didn't just come up with this notion of inclusion on his own. He got that notion from Jesus, who shows up in this gospel today as someone who has attracted the attention of leaders within his religious institution for welcoming sinners and eating with tax collectors and sinners. They had a problem with Jesus welcoming these people to the table for a meal. Tax collectors who were often viewed by the religious establishment as sinners were drawn to Jesus. There was something about Jesus that tax collectors like Matthew would leave their post and ordinary people at the invitation to follow Jesus. He was a great preacher, he was a great teacher, a gifted healer, compassionate leader, a messiah, and an activist. Someone who actively involved, was actively involved in the Palm Sunday protest against violence as he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey as a nonviolent king. He spent his ministry life in social cause of re-enfranchising those on the margins and on the edge of society, reconnecting them to power, to love, to forgiveness, and the presence of God. People like lepers and blind people and widows and women and children and those whose illnesses or occupation cause society to deem them unworthy to hang out with God. So whenever Jesus shows up, word spreads fast that he is someone that you need to check out. You gotta hear him. 
So there Jesus is drawing people from all walks of life, coming to hear him teach. Problem is that the religious authorities, according to their standards, had identified these people as sinners and unworthy. People in their estimation who lived in contrary to the interpretations of the law and godliness. Especially tax collectors, they had a real problem with them because they were renowned for their dishonesty at times, extortion. Sometimes they would habitually collect more than they were due. Sometimes they wouldn't post up the regulations so people didn't always know what was expected of them. Sometimes they'd make false valuations and accusations. And the fear was that by hanging about, around them, Jesus was simply ignoring purity boundaries by breaking bread with sinners. There were teachings in their tradition that kind of held up this kind of thinking. Teachings like, let not a man ever associate with a wicked person, not even for the purpose of bringing him near to the Torah. In the Mishnah, there was an expression that said, keep thee far from an evil neighbor and consort not with the wicked and lose not belief in retribution. They accused Jesus of welcoming and eating with sinners in contrary to the interpretation of religious teaching. Now we are not foreign from this thought because we were at Corpus Christi, we too were accused of acting contrary to church teaching. There were church teachings that made what we were doing problematic to our religious institution. We were told that having women on the altar dressed in ministry clothes and desiring ordination was contrary to the interpretation of church teaching. We were told that providing gay marriages and standing up for marriage equality was contrary to the interpretation of church teaching. And finally, we were told that welcoming everyone to communion table was contrary to the interpretation of church teaching. Well, 23 years later, we are enjoying a new interpretation of church teaching from the very heart and life of Jesus that creates room for not only women, but LGBTQI and anyone who needs Jesus to know that they are always, always welcome at this table. You see, Jesus never turned anybody away. Right? Jesus didn't turn away tax collectors and sinners in his day, and he doesn't turn anybody away in ours. We just think that he does. So when faced with the demand to exclude or to participate in oppression or unjust rules, we have two options, to fold and allow injustice and exclusion and oppression to continue, writing some people in and other people out, or we can change the narrative, throw open the door, for everyone to have a place at the table. Yesterday, we buried Sandy Zimmer, Pat Lane's wife, beautiful woman who's been in our parish for many, many years. And as they were leaving the funeral, people were going out, one of the guests shared with me a story about Sandy. She told me that when Sandy and her female friend began to start their business together, they went to a bank and they applied for a loan. And when they sat with the loan officer, he looked at the application, he said, yeah, I think I can get you a loan, but first, you two are gonna have to go home and get the signatures of your husbands. And Sandy said, you don't need the signatures of our husbands, we just need a new bank. She refused to cooperate with discrimination and devaluing of women. She knew they needed something new. And that Jesus in this gospel, he models something new for religious leaders. When met with critique about inclusion, he tells the authorities these two parables. The first, the story of the lost sheep, and the second, the story of the lost coin. Jesus changes the narrative of who belongs at God's table. You see, we're living in a time of heightened struggle. As a society, we are struggling for racial justice, for health and well-being in the midst of a pandemic, for an end to sexual and gendered forms of violence, 
for interreligious respect and friendship, for a future that is environmentally safe for our children, and so much more. And so now is not the time to limit grace and love and inclusion. It's the time to ramp it up. And that is what Jesus tells us in these parables. In the first parable, Jesus tells us that he knows his audience, right? He's challenging those who are questioning whether he should be eating and welcoming sinners. He gives them a story about lost sheep, understanding that they would understand the point in his story. Sheep getting lost. This was a society that depended on the sheep business as a staple profession to keep food on the table, to contribute to economic stability of the community. From sheep came all kinds of things. It came milk and they were temple offerings, they were clothing, you could get meat from them and so much more. One could not afford to lose a sheep from its herd. So Jesus poses a reflective question to his hearers that they would definitely understand to help them make the connection of inclusion and the value of every human life. He needs them to reclaim those who they have written outside the human family as lost back in. They saw them only as sinners who were lost and they forgot that they were still sheep. You know, sometimes we may get lost, but we're still part of God's family with a place always reserved for us at the table. So Jesus tells them, what person among you having a hundred sheep and losing one of them would not leave the 99 in the desert and go after the lost one until you find it? And when you find it, you set it on your shoulders and with great joy upon arriving home, call your friends and neighbors together and say to them, rejoice with me because I have found my sheep. I think of the image of God celebrating over us. And I think of Lauren or Zetta Fry, our hospitality minister. You know, anytime that she discovers some good news or if it's your birthday, she'll come in your room and she's like, it's your birthday, dear, 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 dear. It's your birthday, dear. I was like, that's what God does. <laughs> and see, this is good news for us, right? Those of us who have ever been lost or felt insignificant, thinking that we don't matter to God, that God's got other people and other things to worry about besides us, that I'm too lost for God to reach me. And sometimes people tell me that, but Jesus comes today to prove that thinking wrong. Jeez, if, if getting lost is what writes us off, aren't we all in trouble? <laughs> because in fact, we've all felt lost at some time or another. And it was God's grace that found us, whether it was through a struggle, a loss, a hurt, or disappointment. God found us where we were and brought us home. We're never too far a way that God can't find us. In fact, so many new parishioners tell me that the first time I came to Spiritus Christi, I felt like I had come home. So Jesus concludes this parable by saying, just the same way there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 who have no need of repentance. And then he tells a second parable, a parable of parody, because this time, this parable is a parable of God as a woman searching for a lost coin. Have you ever lost anything? Maybe your bank card or your wallet or your keys? You know, I lose my keys just about every day. <laughs> and I am often frantic frantic searching for them. And when I find them, there is this kind of resounding celebratory, yes, I got them, I found them. So you can feel it in this story about the lost coin. In this parable, God is a woman who has 10 coins and loses one and she could have written it off and said, well, you know, I got nine left. But no, the scripture says that she lights a lamp and she sweeps the house searching carefully until she finds it. In other words, God is turning the house upside down, searching for this lost coin, sweeping frantically, pulling out the drawers of clothes, moving the furniture around, leaving nothing unturned. Why does God do that? Because the coin 
represents humanity, all of humanity, because it's important that you know that you are valuable, that you're not replaceable. God wants to find us, and when she does, there is great celebration, so much so that she calls together friends and neighbors and says, let's party. So don't you ever believe that God doesn't rejoice over you, that you aren't special to God, and that you don't belong at the table with Jesus. You do. Who belongs at the table, at God's table? Everybody. It doesn't matter what mistakes we've made or how anybody else sees us in our life. Just as Jesus puts the tax collectors and the sinners on his guest list, we are on that list too. The invitation of inclusion always has a beginning, but it has no ending. There are no insiders and outsiders. Communion with Jesus is not a reward for the righteous. It's a message of love, forgiveness, inclusion, and embrace of all. You see, because a meal is a very personal affirmation of value. Think of all the meals that you've provided and all the people that you've had around your table. It's why when we welcome everyone to this table, Jesus asks us to extend that invitation of welcome beyond the table, to take his presence out into the world. Dave Regan is one of our parishioners who does just that. He's a trained chef, and he takes a meal once a month to Motel 6 to feed homeless kids and adults. Providing a meal to them is an affirmation of their value, not only to Dave, but to God. And I'm sure they feel that. You see, there's so much connection that happens around a meal together. This Saturday, I attended the reception for Sandy after the funeral, and I went up to a table and said, is anybody sitting here? And there was no more room at the table. And, but they right away, in spiritist fashion, said, Reverend Maya, well, just get a chair and pull it up. We'll make room for you. And so a guest brought a, tab table, a chair over from the next table and made room for me. And we laughed and we shared intimate stories about each other's lives. We looked at pictures. We learned so much about each other. And we left so much more and so much deeply connected to one another than when we started. So imagine that scene around Jesus' table with the tax collectors and the sinners. Imagine the conversations that were happening there. Of course, there's great rejoicing in this gospel over one sinner who repents because you can't be at the table with Jesus and not be changed. It's why we take communion every week because Jesus changes us. When we spend time taking in his presence, we are transformed. We are better able to serve the world. One of the stories that I will never forget was there was a murder that happened almost at the corner of my street. It was just a little bit around the corner on Dewey Avenue. And I woke up one morning and God spoke to my heart and said, I want you to go to where the young man was shot and I want you to preach this message of peace and love. And I said, really? So I went up to the spot where the young man was killed and you know, it's a little tiny parking lot, you know, a bunch of cars there. And I thought, God, this is not even conducive to gathering people to do any kind of service. So I decided to go across the street to Dr. Evans' church. And I asked him, I told him what, what God had put on my heart, and, and I asked him, you know, do you think I could have the service outside, on, outside of your church on the lawn? And you know what? Right away, without question, he gave it to me. He gave me his church grounds to do the service. And I will tell you that we ended up being called right back to the place that I thought wouldn't work. And it turned out that over 100 people showed up on that corner for that service, and many lives of young people were, chucked, were touched and changed. But I realized that it was God who created the table for the community 
We just happen to be invited guests on the list. And that is because Jesus knows that it was important not only for the scribes and the Pharisees to understand that God wants to welcome and eat with all of us, but he knew that we are called to bring God's dinner party everywhere we go. And when we do, we change the narrative that makes God visible, makes God accessible, and lets the world know that everybody is welcome. Is it 
with me like this. Come on. To break every chain. To break every chain. To break every chain. Yeah. To break every chain. To break every chain. To break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. 